Want some help? Oh. You're... You are... Yeah. I'm Batman. This is Michael Uslin. You're listening to Batman on Film. I'm Vengeance. I have given a name to my pain. Welcome to episode number 107 of The Social Hour, a BatmanOnFilm.com podcast. I am the founder of Batman on Film, Bill Ramey. And with me today, we have senior Big Up contributor, Garrett Grev. Gar- Garrett, how are you? I'm doing well, Bill. Thanks for having me on. These social hours, uh, you know, I hear you say the number. I'm like, man, Bill's been moving on the social hours. I see him on the feed and I listen to him all, but I'm always not, yeah. not always paying attention to the episode number. You're stacking you them up. You can tell I'm quote unquote retired, right? I guess I, 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 this is my hobby, yeah. so it gives me something to do. All right. Also joining me is uh, the original Batman on film senior contributor, legacy always contributor to Batman on film, Paul Wares. How are you, Paul? I'm very well, thanks, Bill. And awesome. As always, love to be here. Nothing so, better than talking Batman yes, with you guys. Yes, yes. We're going to talk Batman. And let's get right into it. Let's get right into it. Um, uh, Warner Brothers dropped the first trailer. We had a teaser before. That was way back at at a fan dome, right? At some point, like yeah. two years ago, a year. I was going to say been a while, hasn't it? I, I was going to say at least a year <laughs> and a half. Yeah. Um, so they dropped the trailer for the Flash. Uh, online and during the Super Bowl at the same time. Um, and uh, we all been waiting for this. The hype machine, the marketing is is starting to ramp up because not only did they release the trailer uh, Friday before they released the first poster for the film that featured the flash in the bat cave and you saw just a little uh, shot of the bat wing. And then... Uh, Monday afterwards, they released three character posters, Batman, The Flash, and Supergirl. So they are ramping up. But back to the trailer, that's the big thing. Uh, I already said what I thought about it on the last social hour. I loved it. My love is mainly because Keaton's back as Batman. It was really cool. So I'm going to let y'all give your take on it. Uh, Paul, go ahead, because Paul is, he is a... Keaton Batman Ooh, aficionado yes, and super much. fan. Yeah. And historian yes. as well. So yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to choose first of all, to congratulate the trailer. Um, we'll get onto Mr. Keaton in a moment, but even beyond his appearance, um, the trailer was fantastic. It was, it was good. a great trailer. Yeah. Uh, and it felt like, um, it was it was a movie that I'd want to see, regardless of whether or not Michael Keaton was in it, uh, regardless whether or not I was a DC fan. This showed the general audience what's coming, and I think yeah. the general audience the response has been incredible. And I think this this movie is going to be massive. I think it hits a load of key demographics. Um, and finally, we're starting to see footage from the film. I think it's going to be huge uh, beyond what us fans may think. And of course, depending on what we think, it depends on the echo chamber that we happen to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with the general audience, it's going to be a massive hit. But moving on to 
Michael Keaton, I can honestly say <laughs> that uh, I felt like I was 14 again. Yeah. Um, and which I, that's how old I would have been when the, the 89 trailer would have hit. And he's, he's still got it. How is this man 70? Um, it's yes. absolutely remarkable. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, I know that, that lots of people will be saying, oh, yeah, but he's done it. He's, he, he uses a double, etc. Of course he does. But have you seen him at the award ceremonies recently where he jumps on stage and does a forward roll before he begins his speech? I hope I'm moving like that when I'm 70. Um, he's fantastic. I, I always felt that Andy Muschietti this film was always going to be good simply because Michael Keaton is not the kind of actor that will just sign up for something hmm. Batman related if it's just for the cash. I don't think people understand necessarily how much he loves this character. I know he was out of love with it for a while, but he walked away from Batman forever. And mm -hmm. he would have been paid probably the most of any actor at Hollywood at that point. And he walked away because he wasn't interested in doing that with the character. So the fact that he's come back with a diff different director in a different film immediately filled me with a lot of faith that it was going to be good. Because I just could not see him signing on for something that painted Batman in a bad light, his Batman in a bad light. And just doing it for the money. It just didn't seem like mm -hmm. a character fit at all. So now we've got a taste of how he looks, how he moves in the suit. Wonderful. It's like he never left. So I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm going to be there as early as I can to watch this film the moment that I get yeah. an opportunity to do so. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping it's going to be one of those films where you watch and then immediately come out of the auditorium and go straight back in and watch another showing i've got a feeling it might be that kind of level um and certainly warner brothers seem to think so i do believe that it's their highest scoring movie um mm -hmm. since the dark knight which is interesting so mm -hmm. yeah sensing a lot of excitement all of a sudden about this and people have done a complete 180 as well that's the other of thing course. that i've enjoyed seeing of course of course, uh, Garrett. What do you think? Your thoughts? I, uh, I, I'd love it. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm trying to find. I'm sure I'll extrapolate on that more. But the simple, you know, response is that I love it. I, I was amazed by it. Really, we were over at a friend's house for a Super Bowl slash eight year old birthday party, and I was upstairs, you know, with the grown ups. The kids were all playing down in this house. Friends of ours, they've got TVs like wallpapered all over this house. Like you, anywhere you looked, you weren't missing the game or commercials or whatever you were watching for, right? So I was upstairs watching the game. I'm like, oh my gosh, right? And you know, the other parents don't quite know that we become friendly with the kids' parents and a couple, you know, groups of close friends within there. They don't all know quite how big of a fan I am, right? I keep some things a little close to the chest. I'm not ashamed of it, right? But they don't yeah. need to know everything. So this thing came on and a couple of the guys like, oh, hey, Grav, check it out. I'm like, okay, like I've been waiting for this moment. Like you have no idea. Like <laughs> neither of these two teams in this game were, were teams I'm, you know, emotionally invested in. So mm -hmm. I was really watching, you know, I love football, of course, but this was a highlight of the evening for me, right? And I was just amazed by it. I thought it was an excellent trailer. Um, the way that it was put together, you know, not just the content in it, which of course is the most important part, but the cutting of a trailer is really important. I thought that they did a superb job with this one. Um, it starts, you know, quite uh, slow at first, you know, it's what, two and a half, three minutes long. So there's not a ton of time to start slow, but it starts sort of um, emotionally grounded in, in the, the score reflects that the focus on Barry as a character reflects that. I thought the line about why he would stay, you and Ryan talked about this yesterday, yeah. Bill, why he would stay in this universe and fight for it. The emotional grounding of well, this is where my mother lives, I thought was incredibly smart and effective. And then it just builds, right, and and, and kind of carries all the way through. Uh, I think a trailer that um, builds good excitement 
is a trailer that's cut to a crescendo. And this thing certainly did that as far as Keaton himself. Well, first, before I get there, uh, after I, after the trailer was wrapping up kind of halfway through it, I heard the kids going nuts in the basement and I didn't know, you know, they're just goofing around. They're playing hockey down there. They're playing catch. They had a whole pack of kids. And all of a sudden I started hearing my kids scream, dad, dad. I'm like, okay, they're watching the trailer. Right. So I rushed down and it's not just my kids. It's every kid in this basement is sitting around one of the TVs. They have three TVs down there. They're sitting around one TV, watching it together. And not all these kids are comic book kids, right? Like I've kind of raised my kids to be superhero yeah. fans. So I, I knew they'd get a kick out of it, but all of their little buddies and their older sisters and their older brothers were focused on this trailer. They were engrossed by it, which I think speaks volumes. Right. And I hope mm -hmm. it feels like it's going to be at least, um, more kid accessible. It's a PG 13 movie, right? So there's probably some stuff parents need to watch out for, depending on your level of, of, of care about that sort of thing. But the fact that they were sucked into it, I was really heartened by, right? Like, I think that's just an awesome sign. So all systems go on the flash. I've been excited. Um, now for Keaton, man, I, I had to like, make sure I didn't get too glassy eyed in front of these other parents <laughs> and really expose myself. Because for me, like, you know, you're both a little older than I am, but I was a kid, you know, I was, a, I was a little boy. I was the same age as, as my kindergartner, Benjamin, when 89 came out and it was like in a time machine, man, like seeing that I remember when the 89 trailer first showed up and I saw it on TV first, cause we didn't go to a lot of movies. We lived in the middle of nowhere. And finally it showed up on the one channel we got. And I was amazed. I mean, just blown away, freaked out. I couldn't believe I was seeing batman like that right and in live action like that because i was a 66 rerun kid uh, which i loved love to this day but it was just different and to have michael keaton back paul i think the points you brought up were, were really well founded you know keaton didn't walk away from batman because he hated batman he walked away from batman because he didn't like what they were doing with the story and it didn't fit with his artistic integrity and approach to the storytelling which you know that speaks volumes to to Keaton, right? Like, and and at this point in his career, Birdman really kind of had this Keaton, you know, resurgence and, and becoming more of a true movie star and respected actor. Not that I think the respect ever went away, but the career, you know, your career goes through ebbs and flows. And he's been, you know, at a pretty high point ever since. So there's no reason for him to do this movie besides the fact that he was into the story they're telling and is on board with what they want to do with his iteration of that character. So I'm I'm all systems go. Like, same thing, Paul. I will be there as soon as, as the earliest showing that I can get to, you know, the day before the official release over here. My butt's going to be in that theater. I'm hyped. I was 23 when Batman... Yeah. came out. I was just out of college. I've told the story many times and I was waiting for this film. So I know you said you were, you know, you were a young kid. Paul was a teenager, but I was 23 and I saw that trailer with Keaton and, you know, my old ass got a little <laughs> misty as well because just yeah. the nostalgia because I lived that 89 Batmania and how big and huge that film was. Um, it's part of the reason that this website exists, you know? So I, um, I'm i all in on it with Keaton, and I agree with everything y'all said. He would not have done it if it wasn't something he believed in and he would be proud of. And it looks like, and this is where I want to kind of get into the the meat of this of this podcast, is that at one point, Keaton was going to go on after the flash and be the Bruce Wayne Batman of the connected DCU, whatever, whatever version of the old DC EU that the flash was going to reset. And uh, he even did an extended cameo in, in the Batgirl movie, which was canceled. Um, because we know that Discovery bought Warner Brothers and they decided they wanted their version of the MCU and they they hired James Gunn and Peter Safran to head up DC Studios to be the co-CEOs of that and they're doing their own thing. And it appears that this is going to be a, um, unfortunately, be a one-off for Keaton. 
with the flash. And however, they also announced when they made their big, when they announced the first, which was a chapter one, Gods and Monsters, they also said that there would be an Elseworlds label for DC films. And I want to quote Mr. Safran word for word. Um, he said, the bar is going to be very high for projects to be outside the DCU, the Elseworlds projects. But every now and then, there will be something that lives up to that. My fear, I want to hold him to that, but my fear is that it, this is just a placeholder until um, Joker 2 comes and goes, and then Bat Reeves is finished with his the Batman universe stories. And then it'll be all DCU. I I am of the belief, I've, I've said this for a long time, I've wrote two or three articles on Batman on film echoing this. I think this is something that they should keep and they should facilitate. Uh, they should seek out pitches by quality filmmakers who might not want to play in the DCU sandbox and have to adhere to continuity and other storylines that are going on throughout these films. I think it would be a shame. You know, what if someone, uh, a showrunner, you know, a Peter Gould or someone, some, you know, went and said, hey, I want to do, I want to do a eight part Kingdom Come prestige series on HBO. Uh, just, you know, kind of piggyback, similar to Watchmen, which was brilliant. They're going to tell them no, because it can't, it doesn't connect to the DCU. I mean, or, you know, a Nolan, I know, I'm just using him because it, it, his status, but someone of that stature, because um, they have Reeves and they have Todd Phillips right now. They want to be in the business with those guys and they're doing these Elseworlds things. Uh, I want to, you know, they come in wanna, and they pitch something that's DC and they're not going to do it because it doesn't connect. So that's where I'm at. Uh, what do, what do y'all, where y'all stand on? What do you think about the future of this now established Elseworlds? Where they're going to go with it? Should they keep it? Should they not keep it? Everything. Paul, go ahead and start on that, sir. I, I'm in full agreement with you, Bill. Absolutely full agreement. I think this is the key to being completely different to Marvel. I am of the mind that I'm, I'm okay with continuity with a film um, world it doesn't bother me too much, yeah. but I'm not terribly excited about it either because you can start painting yourself into corners as soon as you start bringing into a continuity. Now, that means, and I think this is what Marvel are con currently suffering from, is that some of their projects now are inaccessible by some fans because they're yeah. like, well, I haven't seen that and that connects to this and therefore I'm not going to understand that so I'm not going to bother with it. And that's always a danger. And I've always thought that the best form of continuity is just don't contradict each other. You know, actually do your own films, just don't contradict each other. Um, so there's that at one end of the scale and then you have this full universe at the other end of the scale. But quite separate to that is Elseworlds. And I think it's a genius idea. I think it's something that I know you and I have spoken about mm -hmm. many times, whether it be Elseworlds or a black label type yeah. uh, of um, filmmaking production, whereby any director can come in, pitch an idea and say, I've always wanted to do this with Superman. And it's genius. Why on earth would you turn them away? You you know, use this banner to make those movies. We could finally see um, uh, Guillermo del Toro's Justice League Dark, for example. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't necessarily have to be continuity, but that would he'd make a great film. You know, the likes of Denis Villeneuve or Catherine Bigelow. You start thinking of these directors that could come up with something amazing that you wouldn't allow them to do because you want to keep everything in continuity. It just makes no sense to me at all. And I think this is where they can really separate themselves. And my God, 
let's face it, there is going to be a huge support for Michael Keaton as Batman. Do a Dark Knight Returns with Michael Keaton or a Batman Beyond and put yeah. it in that banner, that Elseworlds banner. It would be fantastic. Um, and I can't believe the Warner Brothers would leave that on the shelf at this point. The Based on what I believe will be the successes mm -hmm. of The Flash, there is going to be a core audience that wants to see Michael Keaton as Batman again. And the best way to do that is to do another film, be it Elseworlds, um, Batman Beyond, maybe even Kingdom Come again. Yeah. And do it as an Elseworlds movie. I think mm -hmm. it's the best of both worlds, best of all worlds. Get on with it. I'll be there once again, first night. Yeah. Whichever You're... movie it ends up being. Yes, sir. I tell you what, it's this is kind of a uh, birds of a feather flock together type situation because <laughs> I, was, I was sitting, Bill, I had, uh, my wife had to work last night and uh, I put the boys to bed and I had some time to myself around the house. So I was doing some cleaning. I had my my earbuds in and I was listening to the social hour, last social hour with, with you and our pal Ryan Lauer. And my brain was kind of spinning in these same directions. And you mentioned a bit of this stuff, right? And then I was kind of taking threads and and going what I thought were my own thoughts. But you guys are saying very similar things to what I was thinking, right? If this movie hits, like I think it's going to hit, it'll be very, very difficult for Warner Brothers to say, thanks, Michael. That was a great movie. We're on to our next stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. there could be such a huge demand that it would be a bad business, let alone a bad creative decision, simply a bad fiscal decision to not continue to utilize him in the cowl and elseworlds is a great place to do that i thought to myself i was listening what if this is so big they just say hey we're going to do a michael keaton elseworlds worlds movie and paul's you know thinking the same thing you're thinking the same thing um i'll say this about the existence of elseworlds well oh, first let me backtrack just a little bit on marvel because I, I will differentiate myself a little bit here from some of the things i think listeners are used to you talking about bill and I'm not saying you don't enjoy the Mar Marvel Universe, mm -hmm. right? But it's not your cup of tea. Um, I very much enjoy the Marvel Universe. I really enjoy the connected universe storytelling aspects. I think um, while it is limiting in a number of fashions, as it relates to what we're used to getting out of DC movies, I think Marvel has, for good or for ill, effectively reset the consumer expectations of superhero movies. And maybe that's more for ill than for good. But I think DC almost has no choice at this point but to play in a connected universe because this generation of superhero movie enjoyers, guys younger than me, right? Guys and girls younger than me, yeah. um, and, and even my age, expect that to be what you do because Marvel's been so good at it, right? There's been some misses along the way. Sometimes it can be a stifling thing, but they've really done a good job of it. And I think you can continue to fight that expectation or you can find a way to play into it. I think Gunn and Saffron are finding what, what seems to be with this slate announcement. And you can listen to a lot more of my thoughts along with some other BOF buddies um, on the last episode of, of the um, podcast itself on the same feed, of course. But I think they found what seems to be a very promising way to play in that space. However, I don't want to lose what I really enjoy about DC movies and Warner Brother movies uh, to this point, right? With filmmakers that have a vision for these characters, a specific take that they're passionate about, and uh, quite frankly, a, a story that has, um, you know, not always a defined end, but isn't thought of something to be ongoing forever. Mm -hmm. It's not a bond franchise launch it's not a star wars saga launch it's this story that i want to tell with these characters so what i think elseworlds you know gives the opportunity for is for us to really have our cake and eat it too particularly for fans yes. like me now for fans like you bill or people that are probably even more you know further on the spectrum of really not wanting anything connected at all like not just not interested necessarily or interested in some projects mm -hmm. but just are against the whole concept you don't have to watch those, right? You're still going to mm -hmm. get your other stuff. So I, I'm a, I'm on the same page as you where I hope this isn't a placeholder where this is just sort of a banner that gets put in front of, you know, already existing projects that are going to continue on, but they actively cultivate an Elseworlds 
not universe because that implies that it's a separate continuity and things connect, but a place for one-off films for directors that have a vision to go and do their thing with these characters. And maybe it's not even the flagship characters, right? I think our brains always go to Batman sure. and Superman, but we get a dead man movie over there. You, know, you could get these characters that have been underserved on the big screen to show up there. And if someone has a great idea for a Superman story, that's a totally different thing than what they're doing. Awesome. Right. You, all you have to do is Google like any Superman or Batman fan cast. There's a lot of actors. People want to see play these characters. Here's an opportunity. Internet's been crying for John Hamm to play either one of these guys. Well, I'll go stick him in an Elseworlds movie, right? If it's the right thing with the right director who wants to use him, that's totally cool. But I think it, it's, it's, it also, to Paul's point a bit, provides them a way to carve out a different piece of the market. 100%. Right? You, can, you can do both. You, you don't have to just play Marvel's game. You can play them. You can, you can do that thing and you can do the other stuff. That's a little bit more, you know, akin to what we've been grown to expect out of DC movies from Warner Brothers to this point. Let's pause for just a moment for a word from our sponsors. It, it is, I'm not saying, and I'm not, I'm using this as an example because it is actually one of the Elseworlds uh, stories from the comics, but it's just an example. Um, what if someone wants to do, adapt Superman Red Sun? You know, something like that. Kingdom Come, I already mentioned. Uh, uh, the New Speeding Frontier. Bullets is a, you know, is a favorite it's just, of mine. There's a lot of, and with um, lesser known DC characters. It doesn't have to be Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman you know, up front. It can be some lesser knowns. I think a lot of the horror stuff, um, I know they've announced Swap Thing. That's going to be a DCU film. To me, Swamp Thing is something that would probably fit better as a Elseworlds movie, but who am I to make that decision? Right. But I just think it it would be you're you're really not allowing yourself to expand and do something and do something different with your superhero IP, the DC IP that Warner Brothers owns, than what Marvel did. And we'll say the thing about um, and you kind of hit upon this, Garrett, with connected stuff with the MCU is that. Uh, and the audience, and you said, you know, th th them expecting that. It's like people go see movies, these movies, to see what's coming next, and not they don't enjoy the movie they're going to see at the moment. Because you get that with, why should I go see The Flash? Because they're going to, you know, it it, it it doesn't lead to anything. Why should I go see Aquaman 2? Because it doesn't lead into anything. And that's I, that's, I hope Warner Brothers DC Studios doesn't overdo that um, set up for the next thing with their films, even though they're connected, let them, let them stand on their own as well and, and service that character, whether it be it's Superman or Supergirl, what have you. Yeah. I, I think it's, I was having this conversation with a couple of pals the other day. And, um, I think, you know, what we've, what we've watched over the last, you know, decade or so has been this change from, and, and Marvel's really led the way on this, but other studios have certainly tried to replicate it um, most often to lesser success. So maybe don't try to play that game all the time, right? Like, I, again, I'm excited about the connected stuff, but a lot of people have tried and failed. A studio has kind of led the charge in, in moving away from filmmaking in a traditional sense. And I'm not trying to be like, you know, sometimes these big time directors, your Scorsese's kind of get up and say some fairly arrogant things in my opinion not unfounded always but somewhat arrogant but they've kind of changed away from making films to making content and the way that people um, approach that content and digest that content is very different from what traditional film going looks like when you're going into a theater to enjoy the movie that's being presented to you and then you know lights come up and you say wow that was amazing and beautiful mm -hmm. and whatever or that nah, wasn't for me Instead, it's it's switched to this content consumption, and there's been this subculture that's really expanded quite a bit that's gone away from film going and film enjoying or appreciating to, you know, your thing. And it's it's what you were just talking about, Bill. It's the it's the Easter egg hunting. It's the cameo discussion. It's more hype about the spoilers, potential spoilers and fan theorizing about what's next than it is the thing in front of them. 
And it's been very profitable for Disney, right? Like Marvel has done very well at this and they've probably pulled in some people um, and kind of created that, that again, kind of different sub genre subculture of, mm-hmm. of movie enjoying in a way that's been, you know, financially benefiting, but uh, it's very difficult to understand how, um, a bit more of an auteur filmmaker would want to get involved in that business as opposed sure. to I'm passionate about the story and the character and the presentation. Sure. And that's what I want you to enjoy. Sure. Paul, how much pressure well, you mentioned this, but let's say I'm throwing this out there. The flash is a critical hit. It does over a billion dollars at the box office. And with all the, you know, all the research, that Warner brothers does about, you know, who watched it, why they watched it and so forth. Uh, They say that it was Keaton's Batman was the main reason they went and saw it and they want more Batman. How can they not at some point, at least throw it out there. We got to do something with him. We got to do something with him. They have to, right? I mean, at that point, your potential consumers are asking you, for something and you're going to say no they're saying these are my hard-earned dollars and i'm going to give it to you for this content are they seriously going to say no we're, we're not interested in doing that i i just can't see it um so i think there is a very good chance and I, i'm certain that they would have had him under contract in some way uh to cover his various cameos that he would have had to have been involved with going mm-hmm. forward had he been the the main DCU Batman. So that's a, a a fairly easy thing to fix legally for them. So then it really just comes, well, what? What project? What's it going to be? Is it going to be Batman Beyond? Is it going to be a Dark Knight Returns kind of um, scenario? Yeah. Um, and... If I were looking at this purely from a business point of view, I would be inclined to gravitate towards Batman Beyond because, again, it's hitting those similar demographics. You know, he's a a mentor to Barry in this movie, Mm -hmm. uh, a young hero. So that fits, again, with Batman Beyond, that he's a, a, a mentor to Terry McGuinness. Um, and now you can have a Batman that's futuristic. Now you can have a Batman that flies around like Iron Man, you know, and we have mm-hmm. all of that text. So that's something for the younger audience to really get involved with. So I think it would work very well. I would personally love to see some kind of adaptation of The Dark Knight Returns, just simply because I think that's Michael Keaton's type of Batman. But yeah. Batman Beyond would absolutely if i got either i would be very very happy as uh as an audience member how how or big would it be come into that mix too yeah kingdom come correct how big would it yeah. be if they got if they talked burton into coming back Oof. and doing one one final film with him and keaton oh a Dark Knight that's Returns. So hard. yeah that's so hard simply because i don't think burton is the filmmaker he used to be I was going to yeah. say, it depends which Burton shows up, right? The, the, no. We've had a lot of time to see a lot of different uh, variations on Tim Burton as a filmmaker. Yeah. It, it would be huge, though. I mean, think of the media story, oh, right? Like yeah. the oh, publicity, the marketing. That's, I mean, it that's does why itself. I bring it up. It's it's mainly yeah. for that, that, that reason. Do you either one of you think that Keaton would be like, no, nah, I'm good if they ask him to come back again since they canceled Batgirl and then they've changed directions with the plan of having him, you know, having him be the DCU Batman, which uh, has been jettisoned because of the new, I think that's the, a definite the, the, the risk. discovery stuff. Yeah. I think it's I think a definite it, risk. I think yeah. it's a risk and I think it's certainly a risk. However, I, you know, there's a lot of people on the internet and social media that are still a lot. There's a there's a vocal group that's still pretty upset about Batgirl being canceled. I think the vast majority of folks, even after you know the stories hit the trades and you know been picked up by news outlets, still don't know that there was ever going to be a Batgirl movie. And I think there's a very real possibility that we take a lot of what's been told to us at its word 
and that this movie would not have reflected on anyone involved in it in the way that they would have wanted it to. You know, Warner Brothers has come out and expressed support for the directors, for for Leslie Grace, for Michael Keaton, obviously, obviously in a big way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there there could certainly be an element of like this was actually just a hard pill to swallow, but it was medicine that we needed. And if this thing would have been released, it would have been it would have it would have done a disservice to the talents involved because sometimes right the parts are better than the whole it just doesn't bake up the way we wanted it to and i think yeah. there's a there's a very very real chance that that's honest it's not just hey we needed to save some some money on a tax write down which gosh if i have to read one more person not understand what that implies or what that means i'll go nuts but a really true thing that this just was not going to be beneficial to any of the talent or the brand involved. And that, that stinks. And yeah, it feels hard to believe sometimes when there's talented people involved, but it can be true. We've all seen it happen. Joel Schumacher, incredibly talented filmmaker, George Clooney, massive star, very talented, right? Chris O'Donnell, co-star of the last super successful Batman movie, but the, the sum was lesser than its parts in Batman and Robin. These things happen. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, but they just do. Yeah. So back to, as we start wrapping this up, um, with the Elseworlds banner. Hey, Bill, can I just yeah. say what, one sure. thing on this before I lose track yeah. of the thread? Because yeah. I, I know for a fact these a-holes uh, DM me and hit me up on Twitter. There, We do have some hate listeners to the podcast. And I think some of what, <laughs> Paul, this isn't pushing back on what you said whatsoever. But I want to be clear, what we're talking about is if there's fan demand for Michael Keaton and fans are telling the studio we want to hand over our hard-earned bucks for this. It's because The Flash was a massive success, yes. critically and commercially. That is not the same as spam hashtagging yes. uh, a, a, a project, regardless of how you felt about it, that was not a critical or commercial success. That's a, that's a very important differentiator yes. to pull up, right? They would only do that if this thing was such a home run for them that it was undeniably stupid to leave it on the shelf that's a very different thing than whatever verse you're trying to champion that did not work out who's who the the creatives involved have moved on the studio has moved on in a different direction because what people what i see them say all the time is if it's all a multiverse let so and so finish their story right like we deserve this we deserve that you know we're championing it it, it, it's a it's a small very vocal minority what regardless of yeah. whoever wants to accept that yes and those films did not deliver in a way that they would have needed to deliver and warner brothers still tried to go that, back that, to the well for hbo max this would be something different this would be based on blockbuster success and adoration ex- that that's that's when i when i say that the fans demand or the fans want it's because the flash is a monstrous hit on all levels with a general audience with yeah with the general yes with not a highly dedicated audience. subsection small subsection but, because studios do do their research um uh, targeting who watched the film what demographics what age and i mean right. the whole nine yards and that is not that's not us that's yeah. they're looking at the general audience and how they and that's that's what the demand is so your spot on there i'm glad you brought that up garrett because um I don't like being it's, called a hypocrite. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I, I was all on yes. board with Paul. I'm like, because yep, the bottom be line clear. is, if the bottom line is, if those things were successful, they they would be continuing as we speak. You'd be getting more of them. There, we that's, never would have had a that's pause. That's just the way yep. it is. That's just the yep. way it is. So, just to uh, finish up here. Uh, final thoughts. Your pitch to uh, uh, the DC Studios. Um, why keep black or I keep wanting to call it black label because that's what the comic book thing is now. Else right. worlds, which black label is kind of what else worlds used to be, but in a way. And I will say before we wrap up here, one thing: um, some of the best stuff that DC Comics is doing falls under the black label banner over there, um, particularly for Batman. Yes, Batman, the White Knight stuff, Batman the Imposter. Ooh. I mean, a lot of that black label stuff has been really great because it's it's you get people come in, even though they're comic book writers and artists, they're not having to worry about the continuity where Batman falls from the moon without well, a space suit. You know, you know? I, 
I don't want to be overly negative, but um, you know, it's it is it's certainly telling when the black label Batman stuff that's been coming out for about 18 months now has been mm-hmm. far superior in my opinion and a lot of other folks' opinions, right? But it's it's subjective to what's been going on in the flagship titles. To me, it's 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 been it's been pretty it's been pretty sad not to overstate it, like how, how off par Batman and detective have been for a little while. Now there's some hints, uh-huh. right? There's, you bring a new ride. I'm like, Oh, this is a good issue. This might kick off a better run. And it just hasn't done that for me. But uh, the black label stuff has been superior in my opinion to the flagship titles, which is pretty wild. All right. Final thoughts on Elseworlds banner. And, um, and if you want to just one last thing on the trailer, say that as well garrett you start let i'll let paul finish uh trailer's fantastic can't wait didn't bother me at all uh i saw some uh haters quote unquote haters talking about like oh it's goofy um seeing some of the which are you know obviously a combination of stuntman and cgi batman movements and to believe that's michael keaton no nah, man he's batman it's awesome that looked rad yeah. like i was all in for that i thought it looked incredible so cannot wait for the flash uh, when it comes to DC Elseworlds, um, you know, besides, like I said, getting some um, lesser represented characters, you know, DC staples that just haven't made it to the big screen on film, I think it's, it'd be an excellent banner to do that underneath. I would still, people have talked about this for a while, I never wanted it to be the main Superman, because in my opinion, we haven't had a film that really totally gets the entirety of Superman in quite some time you know, since Christopher Reeves was wearing the suit, in my opinion, still like very, very much like man of steel, very much like Superman returns. I just hadn't, we haven't gotten something new and fresh, but still very representative that hit in my opinion mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. But I do think there's a world for a 1930s Superman original sort of approach depowered compared to what we've known Superman mm-hmm. to be for decades and decades and decades you know, doing the things that he did in the late 30s and early 40s, um, get a classic suit on him. Maybe, maybe you do an action comics, Grant Morrison suit, whatever. But a period piece Superman, I think, would be really a, a fine opportunity for a very artistic approach and something different than what the audience is is seeing or, or expecting that could play big for them. So if I was going to pitch something, that'd be that'd be mm-hmm. Garrett Grev director. <laughs> that'd be what I came in with. Very original, I know. No one on the internet is saying that besides me. All right, Paul. Oh, I have so many ideas <laughs> for Elseworld stories. Um, there's so there's so many good stories out there that could be pitched for Elseworld. Immediately, something springs to mind is Gotham by Gaslight. Oh, I think, oh that yeah, could, yeah, just uh, I, I and I could really see someone like um, Guillermo del Toro getting his teeth into that i think that Mm -hmm. would be amazing a period batman um 1930s 1940s um speeding bullets does Mm -hmm. everybody remember the speeding bullets well that one was great it's one of my favorites yeah i absolutely love it um so there's so many that that it's just ripe for cinema um and one, one thing that i have to say because Personally, what I would want to see is Michael Keaton return um, in an Elseworld story. I think the chap to direct that would be Andy Muschietti. It, sure. Michael Keaton signed on for that film for one reason, and that was because he had faith in the director, I think. Mm-hmm. That was his override. And I've always got the feeling that Andy Muschietti is a, a Batman 89 fan anyway by... His uh, the little cameos in it part one, um, yeah, the background theater that uh is showing Batman and Lethal Weapon 2. Uh, and it, it always, I remember seeing that before he was on board as director and chuckling and thinking that was a Batman fan that put that there, yeah. And then he obviously uh brought Michael Keaton back for the Flash, so I think, um. There is definitely one director that Michael Keaton would come back mm-hmm. for, and that would be Andy. And I think, I think the Flash is going to be enormous. 
And I think he, he'll be able to pick his projects. And I'm just hoping that the project that he picks will be with Michael Keaton and will be possibly Dark Knight Returns or Batman Beyond. I oh, just since would you, say since you yeah. attached a couple of directors to to, to your pictures, <laughs> let me let me continue my streak of unoriginality. Uh, but if you're going to do a Depression era slash you know World War pre World War II World War II era Superman, man, people have been clamoring for Steven Spielberg to direct a superhero oh. property for a long time, and those two things, that character in that time period with that director, like oh boy, you know I'm or sure even Joe Johnston. Oh, would, absolutely, would be a great director for that. 100 percent right uh, he's got uh you know and obviously those two are quite familiar with each other kind of grew up learning from the master in some ways but yeah rocketeer-esque you know that time mm-hmm. period superman it, it could be huge superman set in 1938 kind of got a vibe from the max fleischer animated yes. stuff yeah uh you know, li- you know lips you know literally you know faster than a speeding bullet yep. more powerful, powerful than locomotive, locomotive. League- you know, leap tall buildings in single bound. Not not the you know the the Superman God that w- he's came to be, but that that original incarnation yeah. would, would taking be down great. slum lords and corrupt politicians and stopping yeah. wife beaters like you know yeah. bare knuckles busting through door soups. Yeah. That would be rad. Yeah, I I just my thing about the Else Worlds is I just want you I want them to keep that banner. I don't want them to get rid of it after uh, this this stuff that's already in, in motion finishes. Because I think it just it allows them a lot of opportunity to do stuff with DC characters that you won't be able to do in the shared universe, the DCU, or with you know work with some filmmakers who don't want to play in the shared universe world. So that's 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 my pitch right there. Keep the Else Worlds banner. You created it for a reason. Use it. You didn't have to announce it. Okay, so use it. All right, with that, that's going to wrap up this episode of The Social Hour. Thanks for listening. Announcer Rachel will pick us out, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the BOF Social Hour, Jet's official vlog and podcast on Batman on Film. Follow Jet on Twitter, at Batman on Film. Follow the BOF news feed on Twitter, at the Batman on Film. For Jet and everyone at BOF, I'm announcer Rachel. Authoritative, definitive, the original. Batman on Film, established in 1998.